Hello, today is Thursday, May 12th, 2022. I'm Joe Schmidt from TC2, and this is Staying Connected. Recently, my TC2 colleague, Keith Cook, and I recorded a podcast regarding Sprint's pullout from the wireline market. Now, if you didn't listen to that podcast as a refresher, Sprint is now owned by T-Mobile. And on that podcast, we looked at the business impact of their decision to focus more on wireless services and less on fixed line services. On today's podcast, I have my good friends, Laura McDonald and Deb Bowling with me. Both are senior partners at LB3. And we are going to look at this topic from a legal and a contracting perspective. Hey, Deb and Laura, thanks for joining me. So, Deb, what do we need to know? Well, first, Joe, hello. Thank you for inviting me back to Staying Connected. It's great to be here. That's exactly what Laura and I will help our listeners do. Stay connected while T-Mobile Sprint. We'll refer to Sprint to make it easy. But T-Mobile, Sprint's focus on 5G wireless moves wireline to the periphery and eventually out of sight. So do you guys at LB3 see many enterprises still using Sprint? You know, Joe, they're more than you would think. And before listeners turn this podcast off because it doesn't pertain to their company and they tune us out, You should confirm that your company does not use any T-Mobile Sprint or Sprint wireline services, such as Sprint dedicated internet access, global MPLS, VPN, managed WAN, Cloud Connect, and Data Link. Many of these have been available for a very long time. How do you do this? Check your contract database, check your inventory, check your invoices, And check with your engineers, especially those who've been at the company for a very long time. Check with your branches or stores if they've been known to buy things on their own instead of going through your company's organization. If your company is still using T-Mobile Sprint wireline services, find out why. Is there something unique about T-Mobile Sprint service that other carriers don't have? Is it difficult to move to another carrier? And if so, why and how? A few of our clients still use Sprint because the client started with Sprint a long time ago and their services still meet their needs. T-Mobile or Sprint has always responded pretty well to price adjustments for those embedded wireline services. And that explains why a lot of the old contracts remain in place. Price is good, service is good, according to our clients, and there's no need to move. Others stay because Sprint has provided them in IP addresses with their dedicated internet access, and that could be a problem. And others just have simply stayed because there's not been a network transformation that might have driven them to another company instead of Sprint. We suspect your Sprint contract may be quite old, and the service is in place for many years when Sprint was one of the three big IXEs. Whatever the reason, it's a good time to emphasize that it is highly likely to discontinue its wireless services. When it does so, your company has to move or live without those services. So, Laura, why exactly should enterprises start this search? That's a good question, Joe. First of all, we know how much time it takes to migrate telco services. So you really got to start paying attention to it. And of course, you can't plan if you don't know. So you have to, as Deb pointed out, know what services you have, how critical they are and what they're used for. And you may uncover some surprises in that process. You also have to know what your contractual rights are. And the only way you know your contractual rights is to pull that dusty old contract out along with any amendments. Plus, Sprint does a lot of things through order forms, so you need to go digging those out as well. If you can't find anything, ask your Sprint rep. If you can't find anything then, then you're likely to be just under the standard terms and conditions that are online. And that's never a good thing. Those are never favorably written for customers. So, Deb, what are some of these key risks and, I guess, typical contract dependencies? Well, Joe, the first key operational risk is how quickly Sprint can pull the services. You need to check your contract for language on discontinuance, termination, or withdrawal of a then-current service, meaning one you're currently using. The language may be subtle, so you need to review it very carefully. For example, is there an obligation to continue to provide the services throughout the term? Is there a requirement to provide notice before a service or a type of service is pulled for Sprint's convenience? And if so, how long is that notice period? Is whatever that notice period time long enough to move all of the covered services or circuits to another carrier? 
that'll take a while if you don't have a contract with another carrier. And if there's nothing in the contract, as Laura said, the online terms will apply. And those terms allow T-Mobile Sprint to discontinue the service with advance notice. But the advance notice might be via billing insert. And there's no specific amount of notice that they need to give you. It just has to be reasonably designed to tell you that it's going to discontinue the services, not that there is a time for you to move to someone else. So there's not much to rely on here. From a practical perspective, we think a hidden or extremely short notice period is unlikely as T-Mobile doesn't want to alienate its potential business customers of its wireless services, but financial and other operational needs might trump that concern. Deb, those are excellent points. And you also have to look at it from the flip side. You need to know what you as a customer can do to disconnect and whether you'd incur any liability associated with that. So Sprint generally structures its contracts. So for each element you purchase, there's a one to three service year term where you're obligated to buy it. And if you terminate early, there's early termination charges. So you need to know what those are. You need to check your contract. You also need to see if you might have a clause in there that says if Sprint announces it's going to disconnect, that you can then start disconnecting without liability. If you don't have that type of clause, don't panic. Talk to your Sprint rep. If your Sprint rep tells you, yes, that's not a problem, get it in writing. This isn't a big ask. If they want to get off the platform, they want you off the platform. But then again, look at some of the I like services we've talked about in other podcasts. They say that, but then they want to charge you an arm and leg to actually do that. But this goes back to the inventory. You need to know what you have so you know what you need to terminate. You also want to look to see if you have price stability. Often in contracts, your prices are only stabilized for your service term, not for the term of your contract. If that's the case, what the carriers can do and have done with other services is start really increasing the rates to try and force people to migrate. So that's something you want to look at as well and take care of if you haven't already taken care of it. And by the way, to Deb's point, if your contract's silent, after the order term, Sprint can notify you of new pricing that applies. And their online agreement says something along the lines of Sprint may continue to provide the services on a month-to-month basis under the same rates, terms, and conditions, or it can give you notice that they're going to increase. So keep an eye out for that. So what other contract terms affect this strategy? Your strategy is related to the balance between your contract leverage and sprints. And if you're buying off the standard online terms, don't count on a lot of leverage. A contractual obligation for Sprint to continue to provide the services throughout the term may not stop them from discontinuing, but it does give you some leverage. Other leverage that you might have in order to negotiate that waiver of termination liability that Laura mentioned may be available if your contract requires approval for Sprint to assign the contract. Should Sprint want to sell its wireline business, assigning its contract would be critical. Sprint also gets leverage through the contract, though, particularly by increasing your cost or your potential cost along the lines that Laura mentioned, increasing those during the term. An overall revenue commitment is another way it gets leverage. If your spend falls when Sprint pulls that service, even if it's not your fault or you terminate before the end of the commitment, you might not meet your commitment levels. Check for provisions that directly reduce the commitment if indeed Sprint takes these types of actions. If there are none, carefully review the force majeure clause or common law on force majeure in the state's laws governing the contract. A section of the standard terms applies only to T-Mobile. So if you don't have a negotiated agreement, you're not going to get anything from the force majeure approach. The more reductions in the contract about the commitment, the less leverage Sprint has against you, threatening you with a shortfall charge. The IP addresses that are assigned by Sprint for use on its services can also impact your leverage versus Sprint. If your company must use, it's not just a preference, but it must use the IP addresses that Sprint gave you after it terminates the Sprint services, see if your contract lets you do that. Many Sprint contracts and Sprint's online terms expressly state that you have no proprietary interest or ownership rights to that specific number, IP address, or email assigned to you by Sprint. I'm curious, what are the signs that Sprint is, in fact, pulling the plug? Well, we've seen several. Layoffs are one. As widely reported in the press, with many anonymous postings in the layoffs, wireline employees are being let go. 
those that are still in their jobs are finding it impossible to get information from within the organization so that they can serve their business customers. They give examples of a customer needing a contract for a particular circuit and they can't get it. Like the employee that can't get responses to their internal requests within the Sprint organization, responses to your calls, emails, and even your contact through their web portal is likely to be delayed and rushed. You know, Deb's spot on. Some other things that you should be watching for as signs for Sprint or frankly any other carrier that's in this position that tell you that they're migrating away from a service is the telltale sign of end of life, which is degradation of service or maintenance or support, as Deb just mentioned. Usually, you know, you'll say, oh, well, I have an SLA. Well, the SLAs are written, so they're hard to fail. And if you do, the credit is minor. And it's really not something that's going to deter that type of service, especially if they have a broader plan in mind. Another thing to be watchful of is what they're posting publicly, particularly on their SEC filings. So I took a quick spin through T-Mobile's annual report. I'd say 99 plus percent was focused on their wireless offering. That gives you a clue where they're looking as far as the past and the future. If you look at the last month's 10Q, it said that wireline revenues were significantly down the first quarter of 2022 compared to the first quarter of 2021. Now, that's happening for a lot of wireline services, but it was significant and is something to watch as a flag of where they may be going. Doesn't the FCC still regulate Sprint? I mean, won't the FCC do something if Sprint pulls its wireline services? Well, Joe, it sounds nice, but don't count on the FCC. Don't count on the FCC or any regulator to help protect an enterprise customer to either delay or to avoid Sprint's discontinuance of its non-voice, non-local wireline services. And the non-voice, non-local wireline services are what enterprise customers are interested in. So FCC is not much help. And to give you an example, how little help the FCC is, even for wireline voice services, in recent years, the FCC has allowed AT&T and Verizon to provide only wireless services to rural residents in places like Fire Island, New York. They didn't require them to reestablish what had been destroyed wireline networks. Hey, so Laura, on that podcast that Keith Cook and I recorded, he said that the sky wasn't falling, that this isn't a sky is falling scenario. Do you see it differently? No, Keith is right, as he usually is. Even though customers may have risk, they have the options and the leverages that Deb and I have discussed. Again, the big thing is just not putting your head in the sand. If you do elect to renew, and we do have clients who have elected or may elect to renew, You just need to get in your contract provisions that are going to protect you, and you need to be thoughtful about this. So you need to make sure you have the price stability. You need to make sure you have minimal commitments and minimal termination liability, none if Sprint indicates that it's moving off officially. You need to make sure you have sufficient notice if something is going to be terminated. You need to have strong contractual support so that you can go and shake your contract at them if you're seeing degradation of service. And while we believe it's probably unlikely that T-Mobile will actually sell its service, you want to take a look at your assignment clause and make sure that if they do, you have protections that the purchaser is going to be financially sound and in good shape to continue providing those services. And Laura, I agree. And remember, if your contract is old and it's limited to wireline services, Structure your deal term to provide you the most flexibility to move those services while reducing the revenue commitment. And a 12-month contract term with even a one or two-year renewal option will give you some of that leverage. But also seek limited service terms. Laura had mentioned that they're 12 to 36 months. Try to eliminate them or don't go over 12. And that should keep your prices safe while it allows you to reevaluate your commitments as your wireline services falter or are pulled by Sprint. And think outside the box. Do you still need these wireline services? T-Mobile is considered in the forefront of some of the wireless access solutions. Maybe that's something you want to look at or do a beta test and see if that's where you want to focus your future as well as T-Mobile. Okay. Thank you, Laura. Thank you as well, Deb. Okay. So the sky is not falling, but it sure is getting cloudy. 
So you better set your strategy on what you plan to do with your legacy Sprint wireline services. If you do need some help, you can contact Laura or Deb, me or any of our colleagues at LB3 and TC2 by giving us a call or sending us an email. You can also stay up to date by subscribing to the Staying Connected podcasts, by checking out our websites, and by following us on LinkedIn.